one of the things I've always been curious about is all the different things that you use Emacs for, because I've, mm. you know, you've you've been one of our role models for ages now, and clearly you do a lot of Emacsless programming with it. But we you know what's a day in the life of John Weekly, right? Uh, like, let's see. Well, I spend the most of my time in org and GNU's. Yeah. So I, all of my all of my task management. I think I've processed over five thousand different tasks in org mode now. <laughs> <laughs> since I started using it. So I'm a very, very heavy org mode user. Um, I'm always in GNU's, always checking my email through that. I yeah. use ERC. I actually run a second Emacs. So for my Mac, I've built another Emacs under another name, and I use that <laughs> Emacs just for running ERC. And I stay oh. Yeah, and I use that in conjunction with Biddleby so that I'm always on IM, always on IRC, and also that's my Twitter client as well. Wow. So that's always running on the side as well. And I spend a lot of time then in eShell. Um, yeah, of course. All the programming modes. Um, <laughs> I, most of my day work is in C and C++ when I'm not hacking uh, Elis. Uh -huh. So why uh, do you keep your ERC in a separate Emacs? To minimize distraction or just because? Well, when I'm hacking on Emacs, I end up needing to restart it quite oh, often. Yeah. Many, many, many times a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's because... I never know which definitions, uh, you know, sometimes you change a definition from a function to a macro or vice versa, yeah. and then you don't know which other definitions you have to re-evaluate in order for them to inline uh, the new definition. Yeah, and so yeah. rather than have to figure that out all the time, I just restart Emacs. <laughs> Hence your uh, trick of, uh, you know, making sure everything's compiled and also making sure that you're, you're requiring all the files you need so that, that it loads up cleanly. Yes, you know, I just recently fixed a problem in my .emacs, and I discovered that compiling it was not giving me any speed benefit. Oh. I, I thought compilation was what was making my Emacs run so fast, and it wasn't. It was that I was loading, when I was running a non-byte compiled .emacs, I was loading things I didn't need to load. Uh. So when I fixed that problem, which is now fixed in my .emacs repository, Emacs still loads in just, just over a second, but without doing any byte compilation. <laughs> My yes, I, was, I, I must definitely be doing something wrong because my Emacs takes a while to load. <laughs> How long? I, I don't know. I tried using the profiling thing and um, because I'm using the Emacs starter kit, it actually it didn't get very uh -huh. deep. But I, I'm thinking, as you know, it, it feels like 10 seconds or so. It takes a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I can't really be bouncing it up and down like you do. So okay, so you do a lot of Emacs, you know, list programming. Naturally, you're you're on ERC, you're on, uh, yeah, and you're doing your C and C plus plus development. Are there other like really weird things that you do that um, people wouldn't expect Emacs to handle? Let me think. Well, I use I use it to play chess online. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many games in it. It's like I play NetHack in Emacs, so you yeah. know, pot kettle black here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I use it to look at uh, databases. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I use it, let's see. I, of course, use Tramp to edit not only files remotely, but also local files through sudo. Oh, yeah. So that I, so that I can edit them. Yeah. Um, let's see, weird things that I do in Emacs. Oh, oh, and a, a, a mode I forgot to mention is that I use Git for all the version control that I do. Oh, absolutely. And so Magit is a mode that I just basically live in. I mean, oh. for any project that I'm working on, the Magit buffer becomes the home buffer for that project. Uh-huh. And I'm constantly looking at that buffer to see what work I've done, what should be committed now. I haven't made that a big part of my workflow yet, but I've heard such good things about it. Yeah, it's a very nice mode. Um, I use it in conjunction with the built-in VC mode of Emacs. Oh, yeah? So if I'm editing a file and I really quickly want to know what have I done to this file, I'll do control X V tilde to get mm -hmm. the, or control X V equals, I mean, to get the diff of the current file. But if I want an overview of what have I been doing, what have I been touching, I'll go to the magic buffer and look mm -hmm. at the stack. I guess you version control your org files, too. Do you, you know? Yes. <laughs> What do you do to manage? Like, how, how many org files do you typically work with, and, and um, how I do you have, manage all that? I think I have eight, but the thing is, all of my active tasks exist in a single org file. Yeah. The other seven yeah. org files are all archives. Ah. So I have an archive file for every project, even though the project, the live project, lives in the main to-do file. Mm -hmm. That way, when I do an org search, it's only at that time that it loads in all of the other org files to do the search. 
I need work to be as quick as it can, since I'm just basically always modifying uh, tasks and adding tasks to it as the day goes on. That could be it. I've got like a you know humongous org file, and org grief file <laughs> takes a while trying to parse it. So yes, uh... it does. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I I use Dropbox to synchronize my org mode files to my iPhone. I'm mm -hmm. because I use org mobile. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Uh, another in interesting tool I have found is that there's an app for the iPhone called Dropbox, which lets you take a voice note and then it puts it in your Dropbox. <laughs> And then I've changed, uh, I have an org mode hook so that whenever I open my org mode buffer, if there is an audio <laughs> file in my Dropbox box, it will just pop up Dear Ed and show it to me, meaning, you know, you should listen to this and add this as a note to your org mode now. That's awesome. That's like if this and that and steroids. Yeah. So, because, you know, all, all during the day, new tasks are coming in. They're yeah. either coming in by ideas, by email, by web pages. Um, I have a... Um, a key binding I use in Emacs, uh, since I don't use MetaM for anything else, MetaM is my make a note uh, mm. key binding. Mm -hmm. So whatever I'm at, if I hit MetaM, it'll make uh, a, t a capture, an org capture, and it'll link it to whatever I was on when I did the capture. So if I was on an email, <laughs> it links it to the email. Well, there's a tool for the Mac called QuickKeys, and QuickKeys lets you rebind things globally on your system. So I've made it so that MetaM works anywhere on the system That's and awesome. tries to be intelligent as it can. So if I'm looking at a, a, a web page in Chrome and I hit MetaM, it'll take me to Emacs, pop up the org capture buffer, and then put a link over to the web page that I was looking at. So is that so, using org protocol or just quick keys? It's not using org protocol. It's just using quick keys. The only thing quick keys is really doing is it's switching over. And mm -hmm. then, um, then I use AppleScript from Emacs, ah. talk to Chrome and get the information. <laughs> I actually use AppleScript quite a lot for many different things, but um, using AppleScript from Emacs is something I do often. That's pretty cool. What are some of the other AppleScripty things that you do with Emacs then? Um, let's see. Well, um, I don't like to keep Dropbox running all the time because it, it takes a lot of background CPU. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of a few days when I look at my process list and I look at total time in the kernel spent by all processes, Dropbox is usually number two behind the kernel itself. Yeah, yeah and it's it a little egregious to me when I'm only using it once in a while. So um, I have Apple Script so that in org mode, when I say go get my mobile tasks, it fires off, it starts up Dropbox, waits a half a minute, and then stops Dropbox. So it's just <laughs> running enough time to do the synchronization. <laughs> and of course, I use that async module I told you about yeah. last week to do that work. Wow, it sounds like you you know you got it quite integrated into into <laughs> the other things that you use in your Mac. That's fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, the Emacs is the center of my entire environment. So it's amazing. It's just you know being able to glue all these bits together and 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 make things work. That's incredible. What are some of the things you wish you could glue together? You know, mm -hmm. what, you know what are the 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 John really to do? You know, to code some point in the future list. <laughs> Well, I would like it if Emacs had an FFI, FFI a foreign function interface, so oh, that yeah? I, could talk, I could talk directly to databases and to other things. Um, I know that there are, there's a fork of XEMacs that can communicate directly with Postgres, and something like that would be nice, because there are some systems that I work with where it would just be faster and more efficient if Emacs could talk to those systems directly instead of me having to communicate with them over a process. Yeah, yeah. System. That would be cool. Yeah, or like embedding a Python interpreter or embedding a Ruby interpreter. So that oh, yeah. I mean, come on. Vim is extensible in a couple of different languages now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I do prefer Emacs <laughs> Lisp. I have, to, I have to tell you that probably of all of the languages that I've used, definitely Emacs Lisp has been, my, has been the most fun. I won't call it the best language out there because it does have its downsides, and it is a little bit slow. I mean, I can't do it, use it for most general tasks. But it's fun because you see results immediately, the debugger is easy to use, the documentation is great and completely available at the tip of your fingers. So I probably, it may be true that I have written more new code in Emacs Lisp than in any other language by this time. <laughs> I mean, I've done I wouldn't more, be surprised. I've, done more, I've worked on more, much bigger projects in C and C++, but those didn't always involve you know, spitting out reams and reams of new code. Whereas as the day goes by, I'm writing new ELAS, ELISP functions, 
usually left and right to get to get particular jobs done. Well, I'm I'm always running into your name when I'm you know like oh planner oh wait that's not me oh you know remember oh ERC oh E shell. <laughs> yeah, too bad not all of those projects succeeded as well as I'd hoped. No, no, but, but like, even, like for example, going back to you know talking about you know org capture and picking up an annotation from somewhere really quickly. I remember when you're playing around with that, right? And just mm -hmm. finding ways to hook parts of Emacs into all the different parts of Emacs. And it's it's great to see so many people playing around with these ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's and a I nice, see, yeah, it's okay. a great community. It's a good culture around Emacs. Yeah. What? How did we end up with something as cool as this? You know, that <laughs> Emacs is pretty unique among the diff. You know, the the I guess the software packages or the other open source tools I've seen. I mean. You know, you Vim users will be pretty happy, and you know, they, they they share a lot of tips. But and and you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there's Eclipse, right? And there's a ton of development work going on on Eclipse. But Emacs is kind of like it's it's old, it's but it's it's still lots of stuff is going on. Why? Well, you know, my opinion on that would be is that the real success was the Lisp machine. Yeah. Because the Lisp machine was an entire machine that was what Emacs is to editing. So you sit down at your operating system, and it doesn't matter what you're using, your editor, your shell, your document viewer, whatever, they're all written in Lisp. You can modify them as they go. The documentation for anything is available um, as you're looking at it. You know, you can pop the system into the debugger at any point in time. <laughs> um, so Lisp machines may not have succeeded, but Emacs Lisp, I mean, Emacs took that environment and that idea and brought it down to the domain of a single application, the editor. But it gives us all of the cool things about the Lisp machines. The fact that the debugger is available all the time and you know the documentation is completely cross-linked with everything. Mm -hmm. So I and think that's yeah. probably what we're experiencing, why it's, why it's so much fun. And the fact that you can get in, you can tweak this, you know, tweak just that little thing, just a little <laughs> bit, and then eventually end up with this massive Emacs configuration because you've been tweaking it to fit you. Yeah, yeah. I have to say that the the original designers and 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 Dr. Stallman, they had a very good idea when they put in a lot of hooks yeah. throughout Emacs. Um, there are there are other extensible systems out there in the world that are not as extensible because they lack sufficient degree of hookage inside, you know, places where you can latch on a piece of code to execute when something happens. Yeah. And Emacs has got those everywhere. So that plus its advising system lets yeah. you basically change the behavior of anything or augment the behavior of anything. Yeah. I have to confess, it's one of the things I kind of like about the way, say, let's say Ruby and Rails will let you open up classes, redefine functions, and then, you know, continue on mm -hmm. with your work. So it's you know, the, the extensibility built into the very language is very, very helpful. Yes, yes. It also can be very intimidating. And you, you know, you, 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 <laughs> we've talked about this before, you know, that you're maybe one of the few uh, Emacs users over there. I, you know, I will on occasion run into someone who's curious about Emacs, but hasn't really taken the plunge. How do we get more people interested in this stuff? Well, getting them interested is not that hard. It's getting them to, to climb the learning curve that is the, Like the one that goes I mean, all spirally? <laughs> that's right. I mean, my wife's a physician, and she sees what I do with org mode, and she's been tempted to learn Emacs just to use org mode. I but hear a lot of stories like that. The learning curve is so enormous that she just doesn't have the time to learn it. How did we end up doing this? How did, I mean, you, t you talked about, okay, at some point you were very much into VI, and then you said, okay, we're going to learn things the Emacs way. Yeah, And then yeah. you just sat down and you did it. Yeah. Is that something, I don't know, we just expect people to sit down and do at some point? Or are there, have you come across any things that make it easier for people? Not necessarily that make it easier, unfortunately. I think it's a philosophy thing. I mean, I use Emacs. I'm in Emacs and I use Emacs probably 70% of my every working day. Wow. And so it, it, it pays dividends to master yeah. it. Yeah, you know, yeah. every, every efficiency gain I get in Emacs, I get to make use of right away. Absolutely. And it pays off as the days go by. Right. So, I mean, there are people that type for their living who don't know how to touch type. And that, to me, is the exact same scenario. How can you work, make your living as an engineer typing day in, day out, and yet lose the productivity that you would gain by learning to touch type? Yeah, you know, yeah. Learning to touch type, yeah, it will take you a few weeks 
um, you know, either use a piece of software, go to a class, whatever. So there is a there is a hump that you have to get over, and you may not have the time to get over that hump right now. But it is an investment, and that investment right. will pay off. Yeah, it's really you know get to know your tools and get to know them really well because you're using them all the time. Are there you know so in terms of Emacs how? Emacs being very, very big, and Emacs being something that keeps moving very, very quickly. What are some mm. of the things that you want to dig into and learn more about? Um, I would like to learn the C side of Emacs more. I've never known the C side of Emacs. Um, I've just re recently been looking at the bytecode interpreter and trying to, to learn how it does what it does to see if there's some ways to get better performance into Emacs. Wow. Um, so, that, so that for me is the undiscovered country. Well, that's where I want to go next. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a lot of deep magic. Cause, you know, that's yeah. the very core of it. Yeah, wow. it's, not, it's not as crazy as it seems. I mean, it's pretty well done on the inside. Um, Emacs, without all of its Lisp modes and packages on top of it, if you boil it down to just its essence, the kernel is not really that huge. It's a very, very small, very tidy, simple thing. And there, of course, there are places where it has some rough edges that could be smooth, but it's nothing like what people think of as Emacs. You know, they think of this kitchen sink application that does absolutely everything. Well, that's a lot of the Lisp, you know, core yeah, I mean, yeah. Lisp, um, stuff that goes around the little kernel, whereas the kernel is very kind of tight and small. Huh. And um, I want to know more about that because anything done in the kernel, of course, affects everything else. Well, if you ever get around to doing one of those annotated source code with notes and all that stuff, I would definitely <laughs> read that. I I hear you're you're kind of on the you know on the hook for a e shell documentation or whatever else people would like you to write. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, the re there's a reason why the e shell documentation was never written. Um, this would be a whole different discussion, but I have some I have some misgivings about uh, what kind of world the GPL would create if it was everywhere. Because I do a lot of my programming as a hobbyist, but I have to make money programming as well. And yeah. the way to make money through software is usually to sell it. I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, you, if you make money only through services, that never takes off. Mm -hmm. You know, if you make a piece of software and you license it, it can take off. And it can start making yeah, money yeah. for you. You don't have Passive. to work to earn every day. Yes. yes. And then you can use that time that to you now have stuff. to because it's paying you, yeah, to make more software. Yeah. If the only income you ever made was based on services, then you know you basically have to be working all day long. And when would you ever get your hobby coding done? So when you only have six to six or eight hours a day to to do any coding at all, because you know there's other things that we have to do, you want to be able to have a have a setup where you can do as much creative coding as possible. Anyway, mm -hmm. so since the GPL's view of the world is that you get paid through the services, you get paid through the documentation. When I released eShell, my thought was, okay, fine, I've written the code, the code is in the GPL, so it's freely distributable, you know, I can't charge anyone for it, but if they want services around eShell, then they can pay me for that. So mm -hmm. I have always told the community that if somebody wants to step up and pay for it, I'll write the eShell documentation. Mm -hmm. But that's never happened. How so if the community doesn't value the eShell documentation yeah. enough to pay me to do it, then why would I spend the time that I could be spending coding to write it? So do you know like what kind of bounty system we have or something like that for a couple of people, you know, for lots of people to say, okay, I want to pitch in so and so much to, uh, to uh, eShell yeah. documentation? Yeah, do or a Kickstarter one? project, for example. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. You know, you, you've been an awesomely prolific uh, Emacs list programmer, so it'd be interesting. Well, it's for more me. that just that I've been doing it for so long. It's been 18 years now since the first package 18. I wrote that was <laughs> Emacs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were just a kid back then when I was writing a line.el. <laughs> I was 10. Yeah. I've used a line.el. <laughs> yep. Being made when you were 10. <laughs> But it's you know, are you seeing um, are you seeing a lot of other young people also get interested in this kind of stuff? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, it's basically if you're not going to be using an IDE like Visual Studio or Eclipse or something, yeah. Emacs is still one of the two great editors out there. It's either going to be you go with Emacs or you go with Vim. So yeah. it still it still pulls in new people all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's there's just so much, and then once people start customizing it, they get sucked in and as, as you said earlier there, there's a lot of interest in Emacs as well from the non-technical side of the world yeah like writing scientific papers sure sure we're getting a lot of new users just because of org mode nothing else I I know it's 
emerged so how many years ago was that that's well, maybe uh, some time ago and and now it's it's just grown to this massive thing where people are writing their research papers and they're, they're doing <laughs> their data analysis in org babel and, and yeah. having stuff come come out it's you know literate programming writ large yeah yeah i started using it in 2007 and i think it was a couple years old by then already yeah yeah and you know i tried to drop org mode a couple times I thought I, I was thinking, you know, there are sexier looking apps for the Mac. There are apps that have better and tighter integration with the iPhone. So on two different occasions I left or converted all of my tasks over to a different program, <laughs> used that program for a few months, came back to org and I was always I always felt happy to be back in org. I don't know what it is about it. It's just it looks right. It feels right. You know, it's it's got the right balance between um how finely you can enter and manipulate the information and how like coarsely you can look at it at a glance. Mm -hmm. um, other applications that I used, I don't know, there was just something about them that I wasn't getting the tasks done. I would put all the tasks into the application and then I'd be excited about it for a few <laughs> weeks and then after a couple months, I just wouldn't look at them anymore. I would know that the tasks were in it, but I would never do anything about them. That's Whereas, yeah. Go ahead. Whereas in org mode, um, the way I use org mode, I use it like a day planner so that every task that I intend to do is scheduled for a particular day. And so I'm, I'm looking, I'm rescheduling tasks and moving them to new days every single day for, for years now. And it just never has felt like a burden. So some, there's something that org does right. Well, there's that the hack that you you told me about the other time where you uh, you change your window size and so you're watching it shrink as you finish your task. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> I, fit, little, I fit it to the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little motivational hacks that you can do because you can play around with a with a tool itself. I remember when I was trying to learn flash you know, through flashcards using flashcard EL, I rigged it up so that it would tell me a joke using fortune every time I got something <laughs> right. <laughs> It was either that or show me a cute, you know, cat picture from the files uh -huh. that saved off I can has cheese room. You know, the fact that you can hack it to do all sorts of crazy things. That's sure. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just started playing around with its ability to view PDF files. It can uh, be because, what? <laughs> yeah, you can you can use control X, control F and just open a PDF file and you'll see it in your Emacs. It renders them page by page as PNG files and then uses the image viewer, uh, the image magic.
around and I'm renaming things and I'm I'm building index links and you know that might not be a fun task for everyone. I mean, maybe a part of me was what always wanted to be a librarian when I grew up, but I actually get a lot of pleasure out of that. I find it relaxing. I find that imposing order on the chaos of my machine gives me a greater feeling of order in my own life. And then that makes me better able to handle the new information that's going to come in, you know, the next day. Plus, you remember what's in your what's in your file, so you know what you can search for. Yeah, that's a big. That, yeah, it's very important because our memory is, you know, it's not going to ever be good enough to just keep keep our eyes on the thousand things we have in our configuration or the million things we might have on our machines these days. You know, and that doesn't that doesn't even include all the things we've seen on the internet, thought were cool, but haven't noted down anywhere. You know, we just remember that it's there, but you know, we're losing those all the time, and we're not yeah. aware that we're losing them. <laughs> yeah, well, at least until you uh, plug your uh, your browser history into an org thingy that automatically captures all of that stuff. I don't know. People used to have browser true. plugins that did that. But That's then, a yeah, neat yeah. idea, actually. Hmm. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh, I, I like that idea of a well. The reason I used to not have any cap on my history in in yeah. the browser, but ultimately it makes the browser too slow. Yeah. But it would be nice to sort of queue it out to a log file. Yeah. You know, or a database where it just gives the the link, the title, and a synopsis of the contents. That would be kind of nice. <laughs> okay, a, so, so we'll see it next week then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so we've got lots of you know lots of tips on on all these different things you can do with Emacs or to get started, uh, how to organize a huge you know huge huge archive of information, basically lists of lists and breaking things down. Um, any other parting words before I go uh, line up other people to to bring on to this like let's talk about Emacs thing? <laughs> <laughs> Just that Emacs is fun. All of this technical stuff, all these features. The reason I use it is because it's fun. It is. It's a lot of fun, and it's it's even more fun because you get to bump into. Well, I get to bump into people like you, and and the Emacs <laughs> community is so awesome. So yeah, and I got to know you through it as well. That's a great thing. Yeah, you know that when you made me the maintainer of Planner, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never maintained anything before. So that's <laughs> a, I was a university student. It was an excellent experience. Um, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've always appreciated the little cards that you've sent me from time to time through the years. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioning your uses of planner, <laughs> the I things that send you can... are. I actually should send Karsten some too, because I've been, you know, as Sebastian, I think it's a new maintainer, isn't he? So, um, yeah. yes, Emacs appreciation cards. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think that's a great thing to do. Yeah. Thanks, Sata. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. And I'll catch you again sometime. Okay. Have a good night. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>